word that is pretty common across the board of fathers, they're weird. We have a weird sense of humor. We have a weird way of showing how we love you. One of the things that we, we struggle with the most in our lives as dads starts with an S, sarcasm, <laughs> right? How many of you guys have sarcastic dads? Come on. Yeah, yeah uh-huh, mm-hmm. How many are you are sarcastic dads? <laughs> dads love in a different way, but here's what we know. Our children don't always learn by what we say, but they will always learn by what we do. Look at your children. Sometimes my wife just wants to smack my youngest right across the mouth. Why? Because of sarcasm. Where did he learn that from? Mm -hmm. Then we have to be careful, right? Because they are learning and picking up what we're doing. See, I can use it when it's funny. But my son, he just struggles with it. Sometimes he'll say it in like in the most inappropriate times. <laughs> and it's like, oh no. And his mom's like screaming and all around and running around and chasing him around the house. And then he thinks it's fun, but he's really in trouble. <laughs> because he doesn't understand it. Because he's learned from the example that is before him. But he doesn't always use it the right way. So not only do, do they guide what we do, or they learn from what we do, they have to learn from our words as well. Did you hear me? They don't just do, they don't just mimic and learn from our example. They also mimic and learn from the words we say. But what we example, the example that we live is the number one thing that they learn from. So if we're screamers, they're gonna be screamers. If we're negative people, they're going to be negative people. But if we're positive people, guess what? They're most likely gonna be positive. If you're a sports dad, most likely your kid is going to be a sports kid. They may not be, because they, there's one other DNA in there. That's mom, maybe mom's not a sports person. And that's okay. But what we gotta understand is that we need to be the example to our children and who we want our children to be. Today we honor fathers, whether you're biological father, grandfather, spiritual father, stepfather, foster father, or adopted father. Wow, there's a lot of fathers. One I didn't put on there is an older sibling. Are you an older brother? I'm gonna tell you what, I have six older brothers. You know what I tell you about influence as a child? They were my influence. Boy, did I get my butt busted a lot because they got me in trouble all the time. So what did my brothers teach me? What not to do. That's what I learned real quick in life because I didn't want to get spanked. Why? Because I don't want to be disciplined. How many of us like to be disciplined? The role of the father is to be a watchman for our children but also be the one who guides, leads, and teaches. Are we doing that? We look at a society that we live in today and kids don't even know how to identify who they are. We live in a society today that people are all over the place. America, it's like you, when you listen to the news, you're like, I'm so confused. No wonder so many people today, especially in our children, are so ingrained in playing video games because they want to go into a world where they feel safe, a world that they can understand because the world we live in now is so chaotic that it's so confusing. You're like, you don't know. I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. I don't want to offend people. I don't want to hurt people. So I don't know what to do. What we got to do is that we got to stand firm on the foundation who we are that it means, are you a Christian? Do you believe in Jesus Christ? Are you standing on the foundation of your relationship with Christ? And if you are, you don't walk in fear, you walk in faith. Your faith has to be greater than your fear. The scripture in Psalm 23, yea, though I walk through the shadow of the valley of death, I will not fear. So we have to remember that. We cannot retreat into a world that we are escaping from what's really going on. See, God called or, or created fathers to be what? Warriors. You know why you want to play video games that beat things up and, and, and tear things up and why we like to work on cars? And most dads like to do this stuff. Now, I would like to work on a car, but I would probably tear it up because it's not my gifting. 
So that's when I would call another dad or another guy and say, hey, come help me and show me what to do. I don't really want people to come and do things for me. I want them to come and show me things. Why? Because I didn't have a dad who did that. So I could be really good at working on cars or I really could be good in plumbing if I had a dad who really showed me how to do those things. But those weren't my dad's giftings and he didn't have a dad that was like that. And as far as I know, he didn't have a dad who knew how to do those kind of things, right? So we learn from each other, whether we are biological or we are step or we are half or we are whatever, we come together as a family. We honor you because you have stepped up to the plate and you are in the game of being an example to another on how to live, to love, to serve others, and to be an example or a mentor themselves to someone else. As fathers, we do not do this without being mentored, guided ourselves through people God has placed in our lives, through the word of God, and through the power of the Holy Spirit. When my father was unable to lead me, guide me, mold me, and show me the way I should go, God still showed up and sent others to assist. God sent the right person for each stage of my life. When I was a child, I I learned from a very early age, I will never be loved and I will never be safe from a very young age. When you live in a life with six older brothers, you're constantly tortured. <laughs> I mean, if I had just told you the stories, you guys would be like, they did what? How are you still alive today? <laughs> I had a mom who was always working and trying to take care of these six boys because I had a father that was so crippled with anxiety and depression and fear that he could not do anything, which led at the age of three my parents to divorce. My father was very, hardly ever in the picture. I don't remember having a real relationship to my father till later in life. But my grandpa, who was not my biological grandpa, because all my grandparents died, but one died before I was even born. And so my grandma had remarried, and she married a a guy, we called him Papa, and Papa was a preacher. Man, he preached, he was tall, he was skinny, and man, he could throw that leg up when he got preaching. (laughs) You guys wonder where I get some of mine from? I think it's from him. I just can't throw my legs up because I have short, fat legs. But I tell you what, he would get going and he would just start preaching. But it wasn't his preaching that really taught me. It was his action, the way he learned around people. How he would talk to people, how he would love people. My grandpa got arrested one time because he used to manage a gas station, and, um, and it was back in the day he had a lot of truck drivers, which his children, all three of his children were truck drivers, uh, and truck drivers. He started selling these little things called uh, caffeine pills. Well, back in the day they were illegal. Now you can buy them anywhere, but that day they were illegal. My grandpa, this guy is like the most loving guy you ever met in the world. He was arrested for selling drugs. <laughs> My grandpa has a criminal record as a drug dealer. <laughs> You hear me talk about drug dealers becoming pastors? It can happen, I believe it, I've seen it. God changed his life and he became a pastor preaching the gospel. But not only was he preaching, probably one of the biggest audiences he had was his grandchildren and his children. And he taught me, he taught me this in my life. I, I, he taught me about foundation. What is your foundation? Who are you? What is your foundation? And he taught me security. Even when I felt like I would never be secure, he taught me about security. About the age of 12, my grandpa died. And it was, I mean, you talk about, like I can actually tell you like how my life just changed right in that moment. Because that security and that foundation. See, he was teaching me about my foundation is in Christ, but in my mind as a child, my grandpa was my foundation. But he instilled enough into me that when I was mature enough to understand what he was teaching me, I knew exactly what he was teaching me. My foundation is in Christ, not in anything else. My security is in Christ and in nothing else. Then in my teenage and young, uh, young adult life, there was my godfather, Ralph, who's here with us this morning, and his wife, Myra. In my teenage years, they taught me this. They taught me what godly love is. They taught me what forgiveness is, what true forgiveness is, what it means about repenting of your sins. They taught me about what trust is, and they taught me what serving others means. This isn't all by what words they've said, because they've said words, but it's also by their actions. 
watching them serve, watching them forgive, watch them love when people aren't loving. Those are the things that we learn from godly people that God places in our lives at the right time. Then God placed in my life as an adult, Ron Hauser, who was a pastor at our previous church. He's a senior adult pastor who just retired a couple weeks ago. He taught me what it means about true redemption. He taught me about deliverance. He taught me about the identi- my identity in Christ. And he taught me about the power of the Holy Spirit. He taught me that you need to know the Holy Spirit and you need the Holy Spirit in your life. The reason why I'm an overcomer today and my identity is I am an overcomer. My identity is I am the son of the great I am. And the reason why I am able to walk in that is because of the power of the Holy Spirit. Then I began to learn from my stepfather, who was an alcoholic, I learned that God can heal you completely from addiction. I also learned what it really means when you read the words transformation. What it means to see somebody be recreated. The man of God he is today is that he's not the same God, he, a guy he was when I was a kid because he was very absent because he was always in the bar. I remember walking in that bar as a little kid and I'd walk in and I'd be like six years old. I'd walk into the bar, my mom would pull up, man, steam coming out of her ears. She's so mad because she got home with all these kids. And she'd pull up, make me run in there because she wanted him to be embarrassed. I'd walk in there and I'd go, is my daddy here? <laughs> oh, he would just, he would start to cry. But today, he starts to cry because he starts to cry because of how much Jesus loves him. And how much that God has changed him. That my children don't even, can't even fathom that he was the man that we have talked about because he's been so changed. God recreated him. Then here's another example that you guys all witness on a weekly basis. Jack Millitzer. What have I learned from Jack? Stand firm in your faith. Stay the course. Serve as you as you are serve as you are serving Jesus Himself. Has Jack said these in words? I'm sure he has. But I tell you what, if you watch the man, you see that example weekend and week out. Are these perfect men? No. Ask their wives, they'll tell you. <laughs> They're not perfect men, but they pursue the perfecter. They're not perfect men, but they pursue the perfecter. Their example outweighs the mistakes that they have made in their lives. The bad decisions, the the moments of anger, their examples of who they are because they're not afraid to say, forgive. They're not afraid to say, forgive me for, for, for being angry or being upset when I shouldn't have been. But here's another one that I learned. It was my dad. My dad who's now with Jesus. In the last days, as I told you before, I never had a relationship with my dad really. But in the last days, I was his caregiver. And what I learned from my dad is the power of miracles and what true restoration is. See, God's word says that God will restore with the years that the locust has stolen. Do you believe that? When God transforms, when God delivers, when God moves, the things, the desires of your heart, God will restore those. There are things that the devil wants to take and kill and destroy, but God will restore those. Do you believe that this morning? The reason why we go through struggles in our lives is because the devil wants to seek, kill, and destroy. Sometimes we go through troubles in our lives because the Lord is moving in us and trying to teach us something. Do you believe that? Fathers, do you teach your children that it's okay to fail? As long as you learn from it, move on. It's okay to fall. As long as you get back up, it's okay to cry because as you cry, that means God is washing you. Do you believe that? 
Fathers, we have to be the examples. We read in scripture about the pruning. We read in scriptures about we reap what we sow. What is the example that we are sowing into our children? What is the example we're sowing into the loved ones that are here in this church today that may not be our biological children, but they are our little brothers and sisters in Christ, amen? What are we sowing into them? Are we sowing a complaining spirit? Are we sowing them complacency? Or are we sowing them love? Are we sowing them power? Are we sowing into them authority in the name of Jesus? Are we sowing in them, look, you need to fight for the injustice. Don't just give in to injustices, fight for injustice. Stand up for the poor, stand up for the widow, serve the widow, take care of the widow, take care of the poor. When you see the homeless person on the street, don't automatically assume that person is just going to rip me off. That's between them and God. We got to bless them anyways. Say, you know what? Bless you in the name of Jesus. Jesus told me to give you this dollar. You better use it for a No, that's, that's, that's manipulation. That's, that's, that's from the devil. Sorry. I just wiped my nose and then my mouth. That is so gross. <laughs> Sometimes I learn through these dads' words, but I learn so much more by not what they have said, but by the example of how they have lived their life connected to Jesus. If you will turn to me this morning to the book of Isaiah, chapter 61, we're going to look at verses 1 through 3. This is the scripture that I really believe that this is who God wants us to be. Our identity is in Christ, but this is the characteristics that we need to have. It says in Isaiah 61, verses 1 to 3, Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me. Because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor, he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom and and the captives, and release from darkness from the prisoners, to proclaim to the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of the spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. God is calling us to be oaks of righteousness. What does it mean? Why would they use the word oak? I just heard a message on this a couple week, weeks from actually Pastor Ron Hauser's son, Mike Hauser, who pastors up in um, Holland, Michigan. And he preached on this when his dad was retiring about this scripture. But let me give you a little bit more reason why he was talking about his dad being an oak of righteousness. And we all need to be oaks of righteousness, whether we're dads or whether we're moms, whether we're grandmas, grandpas, aunts, and uncles. We all need to be oaks of righteousness. Why? Here's what we learn about oaks. Oak trees are one of the strongest trees out there. Oak trees have the strongest bark. Why? To to protect them from fire, to protect them from the enemy. Because if you're a tree, fire is your enemy. So this bark is created to be so thick that it protects you from the, the fire. The other thing about oak trees is that they grow so big and have such huge branches that cover, and they always are reproducing fruit. Why I say they're reproducing fruit, have you ever seen acorns in your yard? There's a lot of them. Constantly reproducing. If you let an oak tree go and you don't mow those oak, you would have a whole yard for oak trees. That's how powerful they are. Let me tell you about the, another thing about oak trees. As big as their branches are, it's the same size, it mirrors their roots. So when the high winds come, when the storms come, you don't see a lot of oak trees fall unless they're dead. Why? Because of their root system. Why? Because of their strength. So God is calling us to be oaks of righteousness. That we are so strong and living a life that is holy. That we're living a life of pursuing what God has called us to do. That we are such a holy, righteous example of who God is. Not perfect people. 
Not perfect people, don't get me wrong. God has not called us to be perfect. We are not in this sanctuary this morning because we're perfect people. We're here because we know we need Jesus. The reason why we're here this morning is because we're imperfect people pursuing the perfecter. Because we want to be more like Christ. And this is what God is calling us to do, is to be like Christ. Be the example of who Christ is. This is who we are called to be, is oaks of righteousness. If you would turn with me this morning to uh, the book of John, chapter 15, and we're going to look at verses 1 through 17. See, in this scripture, we're talked about God being the farmer, Jesus about being the vine, and us being the branches. See, as oak trees, as we are the branches of the oaks, we are covering so much. But also as we are covering, we also learn that we must be pruned. We have to be pruned. So let's go ahead and read this scripture here. It says, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me and I also in you. No branch I can bear fruit by itself. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me can do nothing. If you do not remain in me and you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers, such branches are picked up, thrown in the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so that everywhere, whatever you ask in my name, the father will give you. This is my command, love each other. Wow. That's powerful. Powerful. So if we remain in the brand, into the vine, our branches will produce, produce much fruit. What does it mean to remain in the vine? It means that we have to accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, but it's not just a one-time statement we say. It means that we have a relationship with Jesus Christ, an intimate relationship through prayer and through reading of his word. When the devil comes against us, we're able to use that word right back at him and say, no, that's not true. You're alone and nobody will ever love you. No, nope, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, whomever shall believe shall have eternal life. Okay, nope, I'm loved. He loved me before I even accepted him as my Lord and Savior. And the word also says he will never leave me nor forsake me. Nope, I'm not alone. So quit trying to tear me down. See, what the devil does is that people in this world have said stuff about us or said things to us that has pierced us. And we hold on to those things. And if somebody else says it or if the devil keeps reminding us back to it, what does it do? It cripples us. And then we're not able to do what God has called us to do. But here's another thing. Don't always look at it as a persecution. Look at it as a pruning. Because sometimes the Lord will remind you what somebody says because he wants to see if that's how you're going to respond to it. Because he's saying, look, Deep down inside of you, you feel like you're still alone. I've already told you I would never leave you nor forsake you. Right, right. And I've already revived you when you accepted me as your Lord and my Savior. 
You say you're weak, I say you are strong. Why? Because I've given you the power of my Holy Spirit. So you need to prune that off. You need to cut that out of you right now. You are not alone. I will never leave you nor forsake you. I have encouraged you. I have empowered you with my Holy Spirit. Do you believe that? And then as you prune, you get to produce more fruit. Because you know why? Because you know while we're walking around, I'm alone and nobody loves me. You walk around going, I am loved, I am never alone. I can walk with the great I am every day. And he empowers me and he encourages me. Because there are other people out there who don't know who Jesus Christ is. They don't know that they are loved and they will never be left alone. So they need you to go out and say, I understand what it means to feel alone, but I also know what it feels not to be alone and let me tell you why let me tell you about who Jesus Christ is do you believe that the devil wants to remind you to cripple you but God wants to remind you who he is who your what your identity is in him we aren't what people say to you we aren't about the gossip Sometimes there might be gossip. When you hear gossip, you know what you do? Or you hear a word about you, you sit back and go, is there any truth to this? Nope. I rebuke that in the name of Jesus. I rebuke that word in the name of Jesus. You know what you also do? You find the source. You find the source. Who's, who's bad-mouthing you? Christina, if you're bad-mouthing me and you're saying stuff that's not right, <laughs> my job is to come, hey, Christina, how are you doing? You, know, you go in love. You don't go in like slapping her and all that stuff. <laughs> you go to her and say, hey, I don't know if this is true or not, but somebody had told me that you said this. Guess what? Most likely she'd say, well, I said that, Pastor, but I didn't mean it that way. Because <laughs> how many times does that happen? We interpret things the wrong way. Because she may have been busy and she just shortly said something. Right? Have you ever seen that where somebody just responds in a short manner and they really don't mean anything but then it gets around? And then then guess what? Everything is resolved. Now, if she's gossiping, it's an opportunity for us to teach her about how gossip destroys. Do you guys believe gossip destroys? Gossip will destroy every family, gossip will destroy every organization, and gossip will destroy every church. So if somebody comes to you and they start talking to you about somebody else, whoa, 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 whoa. I don't want to hear it because I, I, I don't participate in gossip. Or they walk in and say, well, Fred, we really need to pray for Luke because you know Luke is doing this, this, and that, right? <laughs> so we really need to pray for him. Right? I just gossiped all about Luke <laughs> and I covered it up with prayer. Yep. Yep. Where I could go to uh, Fred and say, Fred, we need to pray for Luke. He's dealing with some stuff. I didn't say anything other than he's dealing with some stuff, right? So now we're two, two or three gather the name, that's where the Lord is also, right? So now we can begin to pray for Luke and his issues, because he's got a lot of issues. <laughs> Just kidding. Right? And so I did not gossip about that, but we do that. I don't think we always do that on purpose, but we do do that. We need to be self-aware because why? We want to live a life of righteousness. We want to be oaks of righteousness. We got to be careful about if we're tearing people down. We don't, we're not called to tear people down. We're called to lift them up. Even though there's people who live differently than we do. If you have an adulterer and you know that, you don't go around and put a scarlet letter on them. You go to them, you try to befriend them so that you can obviously get an opportunity to lead them to Jesus and lead them away from their sin, right? right? But no, the church today, not our church, because I haven't seen this in our church, and I don't believe our church would do this, but I know the church as a whole has got to have a bad reputation because we sit and we don't do anything, but man, we sure will pass judgment. And that's what God did not call us. God is the only judge, people. All we can do is love people and lead them to the truth of God's word and lead them to Jesus Christ. We can lead them to the water, but we can't force them to drink. Well, the other part we got to remember is we aren't the one who saves. We are the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. We are the branches that are attached to the vine and that we go and we teach. And we teach by our example and we teach by our words. Our words will be empty if our example does not support our words. 
We are called to be the example, but we have to be attached to the vine. We also learn in the uh, book of Acts chapter one, verse eight, we almost quote this one here at Lighthouse, but you will receive my power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses all Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the other most parts of the earth. What does that mean? We have to have the Holy Spirit. To be oaks of righteousness, to be the example that God wants us to be to our children and to other people, we have to have the power of the Holy Spirit. As I said before, I am here today because the power of the Holy Spirit. Let me tell you this, if it wasn't for the power of the Holy Spirit, I'd still be living in Dayton, Ohio. Because I lived in a job I loved, I loved my pastor, I loved the people of my church. But then God told me, I'm starting to do some transition here. I'm not like a transition, what do you mean? I'm thinking maybe transition within the church. I, I wasn't for sure what transition mean about six months, and then six months later, I get a phone call saying, do you want to come to uh, Toledo? I said, no. <laughs> I live in Dayton. Dayton and Toledo, there's not much difference. You know, I'm like, why? I want to go south where it's warmer. It's colder up there. I don't want to go up to Toledo. And so I said, no. And then they said, I want you to pray about it. Well, now I go to my wife, and we start praying about it. I go to my pastor, and I go to talk to my pastor, and as soon as I w- sat down in his office, I- I'm asking him to pray for us. Because I'm going to my authority, my earthly authority, right? So I got my authority, I said, I need you to join us in prayer about this opportunity. As soon as I opened my mouth, I said, Pastor, I'm moving to Toledo. And, pastor, and the pastor just looked at me and goes, So did your wife. So, yeah, and my wife did too, because she didn't know either, because I told her we were just praying about it. And so, and so it was the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, right in that moment, you're stepping out and I'm gonna be with you. I'm gonna comfort you, I'm gonna guide you, and I'm going to lead you. But I want you to turn from everything you've ever known, and I want you to go to Toledo, Ohio. And so I come to Toledo, Ohio, I had to take a pay cut to come to Toledo, Ohio. I'm like, Lord, what's going on here? But did you know that, you know, even though I had to take a pay cut because I went from a larger church to a smaller church, and I came as an associate pastor, uh, the Lord said, I got this. So he blessed my wife with a promotion where she made even more money than what we just cut. That's how good God is. All God wants us to do is to step out in faith. All God wants us to do is be so connected to the Holy Spirit that we have such a trust, a spiritual trust, that whatever the Holy Spirit leads us to do, we just step out into it. And needless to say, 18 months after I got here, the pastor that left me in in Dayton also left me here at Toledo. (laughs) I became a missionary to Sweden. I said, I will never follow you again. <laughs> Thank God I'm following the Holy Spirit and not you. And so, and so as he left, I said, I said uh, or, or actually the board came to me at the time. We had a very small board at that time. The board came to me and he said, they said to me, we want you to consider about being uh, our lead pastor. I said, nope, that's not in my calling. <laughs> Well, the wiseness of that board, they said to me, I want you to take your wife, and I want you guys to go get a hotel. You don't tell your married people, go get a hotel, come on. I want you to take your wife, get a hotel, and we want you to go to somewhere, and I want you to just take time and pray, take a week off and pray. Yeah, Angela said suckers. <laughs> So God, so God sent us, so the, the board sent us on this retreat. We had a time of prayer and fellowship and just the two of us reconnecting, and we, we just prayed and interceded, and at the end, the last week, we didn't really talk a whole lot about it. My wife just looked at me, like right before we started driving back, my wife looked at me and says, so what did the Lord tell you? I said, I think we're supposed to stay in Toledo. And she goes, all right, my people are where your people are. I will go where you will go. And so here we are. But it's by the power of the Holy Spirit. There's been some lots and ups and downs when I became a lead pastor because I've never been a lead pastor before. There were some good things, there were some bad things. There were things that I've learned and there's things I've grown from. There was a lot of pruning and there was a lot of just cutting off. But here's what we know. Because of our faith in God, the encouragement of the Holy Spirit, the guiding and the leading of the Holy Spirit, we are here today. 
that we can go through good times and bad times where we know that we will never be left alone. We will never be forsaken for God is always with us and it's the Holy Spirit will lead us and comfort us and guide us. Do you believe that in your life? Sometimes we go through hardships and we go through those valleys. We go through those valleys not because it's always the devil coming after us, but it's because God is trying to prune us because he wants us to produce more fruit. I tell you today, I feel like I produced more fruit today than I did three years ago. Amen? Amen. And why? It's because I've gone through some things that I had to prune and the things that I had to cut off. But here's the thing, I can't hide in it. I can't hide in a movie. I can't hide in television. I can't hide in a book, I, unless it's the Bible. I can't hide into video games. I gotta face my issues. I gotta stand firm on who I am in Jesus Christ, and I have to fight for the injustices of this world. Yes. Yes. That's us as a church, as a body of believers, we need to stand up and rise up together, encouraging each other, and rising up with our, and putting our swords up in the air, and fighting for the injustices of this world. We live in a city today that is riddled riddled with sex trafficking, drugs. We need to stand up against that. There are families that are are falling apart. We need to stand up for the family. We need to start counseling people, not just the pastor counseling people. If you know the word of God, you can cancel. That's the only thing I do. I sit and I listen to people and I cancel them about what the word of God says. We can all do that. Oh, let me tell you what my God says. Man, the power that you can do in witnessing through people through the scripture. When we all rise up and do this, I'm gonna tell you right now, sex trafficking will decrease. Drug addiction will decrease. Drug trafficking will decrease. The gang violence will decrease. Racism will decrease. When the church rises up, and we start to prune, and we stop hiding, and we start fighting. Yes. And we gotta fight for those injustices in the world. You wanna talk about homelessness. Homelessness will stop if the church rises up and begins to help those that are homeless. When we see the example of Pastor John and Pastor Terry that are reaching out to those who are homeless and those who are alone, we see their example, and we should, they shouldn't have to beg for people to come and serve. We should be lining up, and we need her to be able to say, them to be able to say, look, 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 we can only get four people or five people in the kitchen. So um, let's put you over here, and you can serve over here. Amen. We have other kitchens that we work with. We work with Outreach, we work with Cherry Street, and we work with uh, Vision Ministry Kitchens. We have so many kitchens that are dire need of volunteers. But as a church, not just our church, but all church, we need to rise up and take care of those who are poor and needy, and those who are widows and widowers. And the only way we can do that is through the power of the Holy Spirit. We also find out in book of Philippians, chapter 3, verses 17, it says this, we join together and follow my example, join together and following my example, brothers and sisters, and just as you have, have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. Wow. Paul is saying, don't look at me because I'm perfect, but look at how I'm pursuing the perfecter. I'm pursuing Jesus. We are all called to be like Jesus. So you know what? If you can't model the words of Scripture, model those brothers and sisters in Christ that you know that are pursuing Jesus and following Jesus. Who is those mentors in your life? I'm going to tell you guys, if you want to see how to love people and how to serve people, look at Jack Milliser and Dallas Milliser. If you want to look at people who can, uh, and you want to say, man, I want to learn how to pray in revival. Look at Sister Lynn. Man, when you get her going, you guys think she's great up here? Come on a Friday night and see her pray. Oh. mm. That's what we want to look at, is look at those people in our lives that are here in this church and in our lives that we can look and say, I want to be like them who are following Christ, because I also want to be an oak of righteousness. As the worship team comes back up this morning, there's one more scripture I want you guys to to hear, and that is in Titus, the second chapter of Titus, verses three through seven. And it says this, in everything, set them an example by doing what is good. In your teaching, 
show integrity, seriousness, and soundness of speech that cannot be condemned, so that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us.